Alberto Rodriguez is a quiet man. He's a mechanic and the owner of Los Primos Auto Repair on Irving Avenue in Ridgewood, Queens. O sea, el negocio yo lo compré ahora casi, pero tenía mucho tiempo trabajando para Primo. Soy dominicano. Nací en Santiago. Resido aquí en Brooklyn. Hace estoy aquí desde el 90. Hace como 20, 20 años. Eso esto tiene su alta y su baja. Eso no que uno siempre está bici, 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 no. Hay semanas que se, se trabaja mucho, hay semanas que no se trabaja mucho. Tú sabes que eso es dependiendo cómo los carros se dañen mucho tiempo. Ese es el problema. Desde pequeño estoy trabajando con carros, desde que tengo ocho años. Cuando uno iba a la escuela, después que uno salía de la escuela no había otra cosa que hacer. Entonces los papás de uno, ah, pues ve aquí a este taller y va aprendiendo algo. Me quedé con eso. Una profesión ahí, aprendía en la calle. Today, the street in front of Alberto's shop is radioactive. It's a legacy of nuclear weapons development and the industrial contamination that spread across New York. And despite this, there are only two active Superfund sites within the city, the Gowanus Canal and the Newtown Creek. Judith Hank, the EPA regional administrator, wants to add Alberto's shop to the list. I think what's important here is this is right in the heart of the community where people live and work every day. But what really sticks with me is when I read the health report and there was a recommendation that people not lay on their back in the auto body shops. And I, I just had this concern that all day long a number of the guys are underneath the car not suspecting that just coming to work every day to do their jobs is potentially causing a health risk for them. Recent studies have shown that radiation levels in the auto body shop are significantly higher than federal guidelines recommend. But the first contamination might have happened almost 100 years ago. Harry Wolf was a tailor's son. He was born in Brooklyn in 1894 and graduated from City College in 1914. By 1918, he was processing chemicals at a laboratory on Irving Avenue, which runs along the border of Brooklyn and Queens. The lab was operated by two brothers, Marks Hirsch and Alcan Hirsch, who were both engineers and inventors. Alcan, the older brother, was an upper-class socialite who dabbled in left-wing politics in the 1920s. And in the 30s, he worked as a chemical consultant in the Soviet Union, where he reportedly had his Rolls-Royce shipped over from the United States. The Hirsches specialized in processing monazite sand for rare earth metals, which are used in a variety of industrial contexts, from steel plates to lighters. But the brothers eventually became interested in more than processing rare earths. They wanted to mine them. And they helped found the Molybdenum Corporation, which was, at one time, the world's largest rare earth supplier. In 1923, the Hirsch brothers transferred the small laboratory on Irving Avenue to Harry Wolf and his partner Max Alport, who put their names up above the door. For the next 30 years, the company continued to process monazite sand by treating it with sulfuric acid under intense heat to separate out the rare earths from thorium. Today, you can still see the arches that led into the area where the kiln once stood. It was dangerous work, and there were multiple explosions at the lab. Throughout the 30s and 40s, the company kept shipping out rare earths and dumped the radioactive thorium into the sewer. But that thorium waste was about to get a lot more valuable. Thorium is the 90th element in the periodic table. And there was some research done on it by a uh, chemist by the name of Berzelius. He named it after Thor, the Norse god. And the uranium and the thorium are born in the death throes of a supernova when a star is exploding. And that's where the energy came from that's stored in this nucleus. These heavy elements are divided into two groups. One are called fissile, the ones that can fission. So there's uranium-235, plutonium-239, and uranium-233. 
But then there are elements that can be bred and become fissile, and they're called fertile. So the thorium essentially is fertile. It's ready to be bred into the uranium-233, and there's so much of it that it was it wouldn't have made any sense not to explore it. Since thorium can be converted into fissile material, by the 1940s it was being considered as a fuel for nuclear weapons and reactors. In, uh, I think, the late 1940s, the Atomic Energy Commission that had been created uh, as sort of an outgrowth of the Manhattan Project became aware that this company had this product that was radioactive and became aware that Wolf Alport was pouring that material down into the city sewer system. So the Atomic Energy Commission came in and issued an order that said, don't do that anymore. And then they actually bought this waste product thorium oxalate from Wolf Alport, and it was used elsewhere for some other purposes. One of thorium's purposes was demonstrated in this film from 1955, when a bomb made from uranium-233, the isotope bred from thorium, was detonated at the Nevada test site during Operation Teapot. Later, scientists at the Oak Ridge National Laboratory developed this molten salt reactor, which ran on thorium. Eventually, military and civilian nuclear interests coalesced around uranium and plutonium, leaving thorium behind. But the contamination from those early days still lingers across the country and at Alberto's repair shop in Queens. For an individual working outdoors at the body shop for a reasonable number of hours a day, would be expected to get about 300 millirem per year. Millirem is a, is a measurement of radiation dose, and that's the basic unit. That's the amount of energy uh, which is deposited in, in the body of any given person. So that's, that's the key number. There is a guideline of 100 millirem per year over and above our natural background. It's not that there's no risk below 100 millirem and a big risk above 100 millirem. It's a continuum. But uh, I think above 100 millirem, you start to be concerned and you start to think maybe we need to do something about this. To put this into context, consider a chest X-ray, which generates around 10 millirems more radiation than we're generally exposed to. The current guidelines for a single year would allow a normal individual to receive the equivalent of 10 chest x-rays a year. Workers at hot spots in the auto body shop were likely exposed to 300 millirems a year, the equivalent of 30 x-rays. But compare that to the annual limit for a nuclear power worker, 500 x-rays. And an hour next to the Chernobyl reactor just after meltdown, 3 million. So the doses in the auto body shop aren't catastrophic for employees, and they're minimal for customers. But as the EPA works on the site, they have to look beyond the auto body shop itself. The footprint of Wolf Outport was this railroad spur behind the building, and uh, several businesses he here behind us, automotive business, a deli, a construction business. These were places that we investigated. And then we put down a shielding along the sidewalk that is comprised of two inches of steel, two inches of lead, and then another two inches of steel on top. This is a pressurized iron chamber used to detect the gamma radiation, either on contact or at waist level. And we had the pre-shielding survey numbers, and then we, uh, after that we took the post-shielding numbers. And in general, there is at least an 80% reduction with the gamma radiation. Wolf Alport isn't the only radioactive site in the city. In fact, the five boroughs are dotted with hotspots. For example, underneath the Bayonne Bridge, there used to be a warehouse that held the uranium for the bomb dropped on Hiroshima. And at Great Kills Park, a baseball fields on top of a former landfill have been closed for years because of elevated radiation levels. But according to the New York State Department of Environmental Conservation, there are no other locations in New York City with comparable circumstances as those present at the Wolf Alport site which is why the state has supported the regional EPA proposal to add Wolf Alport to the Superfund list. We're very close to the finish line. It's currently being carefully reviewed in EPA headquarters in Washington, because you don't get any old site on Superfund. This is special status, but I fully expect that this will proceed on Superfund listing. Um, if it doesn't, I'm not sure what we're gonna do. 
If the site is finalized, the EPA will have to decide what comes next. There's a range of options that have been pursued at similar sites, from excavating the soil to demolishing the contaminated buildings and possibly compensating Alberto and the other business owners. Until the organization makes that decision, it's not clear what the Superfund status will really mean for the people who live and work on Irving Avenue. We've been hearing about the radiation risks for some time. In fact, this process goes back decades. In 1954, AEC officials had already reported that thorium gas was building up, though there's no indication they notified Wolf Outport or anyone else. The next time any concerns were raised was in 1987, where the Department of Energy notified the city about the site. Since then, various agencies have sent survey teams and debated if it qualifies for cleanup funds. In addition to being slow, the process hasn't always been transparent either. Alberto says that the EPA didn't explain how disruptive the shielding installation would be. No, yo nunca me dijeron que iba a afectar el negocio. Yo la mamá me dijo, mira, yo tengo que tenemos que hacer este trabajo, este y esto. Eh, te vamos a preparar aquel lado para que tú cuando trabajemos de este lado trabajes de aquel lado, pero yo no pensé que el negocio me iba a bajar, pero sí. Bajó, yo no no trabajé lo que era. Se hizo menos trabajo. We did it in a systematic way to impact the, the businesses as least as possible. So we would work on one bay with the shielding, let, let the, the concrete cure, and then move everything back in there so they were able to, to operate continuously. Alberto also said that although the health hazards had been explained to him, no one had told him about the Superfund designation and what it might mean for his business. Before finalization, the EPA is only required to list proposed sites in the Federal Register public notice list compiled by the National Archives. We know we've got work to do in terms of educating the public, but uh, certainly the business owners will be working hand in glove with us, uh, so we make this as least intrusive as possible, but a lot of physical work is going to have to happen at this site. More work is likely to cost millions of dollars, but it may not be just federal money that's paying for the cleanup. One of our obligations is to see if we can find the responsible parties, the companies that actually were associated with the pollution uh, that we're now trying to clean up. Almost inevitably, it's not, it doesn't exist anymore, but perhaps it was purchased by another company and another company and another company. And ultimately, the, a company that still does exist today may own the liability for the long since defunct uh, or, or expired corporation that existed 100 years ago. The EPA hasn't publicly identified companies to fund the cleanup, but a possible candidate is the energy giant Chevron, which acquired the Molybdenum Corporation, or Molycorp, the mining company that the Hirsch brothers helped to found. Chevron, which declined to comment on this story, has been involved with remediation sites formerly owned by Molycorp in Pennsylvania and New Mexico. Wolf Alport itself folded shortly after its final shipment to the AEC in 1954. Claro, si voy de vuelta, yo entré a vuelto y si, no sigo ya, sí. O sea, porque ellos nunca dicen a uno, mira, esto hay problema, hay que salirse. Ellos están supuestos porque ellos son los que saben de eso, no yo. Despite Alberto's uncertainty, there is a precedent here. There are four other sites across the country that are linked to Wolf Alport. Two are the other monazite sand processing companies that were identified by the AEC in 1948. Two are the facilities that handled Wolf Alport's thorium sludge. All of them have been added to the Superfund list. Thank you.